I'm going to show you how to get started reading RFID tags using a PicaDev RFID module. We'll connect this to a Raspberry Pi Pika and get some example code working so that we can identify unique tags and also read and write data onto those tags. Let's get started. To follow along, you'll of course need a Raspberry Pi Pika with pin soldered facing down. This is so it can plug into the PicaDev expansion board. Just plug that in so that the USB connector is on the same side as the two pin battery connector. You'll also need a PicaDev cable to connect your expansion board to the RFID module. And of course, a couple of RFID tags. For the best experience, we recommend NTAG213 type RFID tags. Just before we continue, your RFID module has a switch labeled ASW. You can see there are two little switches side by side. Make sure both of those switches are in the off position. That's where the switches are in the, the lower position. And I've just mounted everything onto this PicaDev platform to keep it nice and stable. And connect to your computer with USB. Now RFID tags are available in all different kinds of shapes and sizes. And there are lots of different standards of RFID tags. I've labeled a couple here so that we can keep track of them. The shape of the tag has nothing to do with the actual standard that the tags used. Now for the best experience with the PicaDev RFID module, we recommend NTAG213 tags. It will also work with classic tags or MyFair tags, but for the best results, we recommend NTAG213. Check the article for the most up-to-date compatibility. In the article for this tutorial, find the download section and right-click and save each link as. I'm going to save these to a PicaDev directory in My Documents. This last file, readid.py, I'm going to save that as main.py. We're going to be working with Thonny for this tutorial. If you're unfamiliar with using the Raspberry Pi Pico in Thonny, we have a tutorial for that to get started. Open Thonny, connect to your Pico, and upload all these source files to your Pico. To upload them all at the same time, click the first file, hold down shift, click the second file, then right click and upload to. And let's open up main.py on the Pico. This is just a simple example to read the ID off a tag. We import the functionality for the RFID reader and also a sleep function. Then we call the initialization function and we get an RFID module object, which we're gonna call RFID. There's a prompt to hold a tag near the RFID module. Then there's an infinite loop. If there's a tag present, we call read ID and that returns a string of the ID which we store in a variable called ID. Next, we print it and loop again. Press the run current script button or control R to run this script. And I'll test the script with my three tags. If I hold up the card, I get some long string of letters and numbers. That is the first ID. For my second tag, I get some other unique ID. The same length, just with different data. And then for my classic tag, I actually get a shorter ID. So that's one way to tell the difference between these tags. So there we have it, three unique IDs. I'm going to comment out this read ID line with Alt-3 and uncomment the line below it with Alt-4. This is exactly the same function call, except we're giving it an argument now, detail equals true. This will give us more details about the tag and the status of the read. I'll run the script again with control R. And now if I hold one of my end tags to the reader, we get a lot of information printing out into the shell. If we isolate just one of these lines, we can take a closer look at it. We have the type, which has been identified as end tag. There's the formatted ID, which is the, the string of letters and numbers that make up the ID. There's a success indicator. So this is true. We were able to successfully read the ID from the tag. And there's also an integers entry in this dictionary, which is just the tag's ID, but represented as numbers, pure numbers. If I hold up the classic tag, we can see we have a very similar result. We have the classic type here. And of course the ID is that shorter ID. And here's the integer representation of that same ID. This success flag, we're done. We're diving into the details here because this success flag can be useful for detecting a misread. If I bring the tag in and away too quickly, 
Here you can see we have a mostly empty line. No data was read. We don't know the type of the tag. We don't know the ID, but we have this success false indicator. So we know that there was a bad read. And that's because I was just moving the tag too quickly. So we know we've got a couple of tags and they all have a unique ID. Why don't we do a little experiment to see if we can make an access control system. Let's say we have a bunch of users with a bunch of tags, but we only want to allow one of those users to, I don't know, unlock a certain door or access a certain computer. So we'll have like an authorized user only kind of behavior. Return to the article and find the access control example. Highlight all of that code and copy that into the main.py file on the Pico. Now this looks pretty similar to the first example. We have ID equals read ID. We even print that ID, but there's a little bit of extra logic going on here. Let's just start by giving the script a run. I'm being prompted to hold a tag nearby. I'll choose this nice big one. In the shell, we can see the ID of that tag and we can also see access denied. Let's have a look at the source code. We start with the same imports, the same initialization. We have something here called authorized users. So we're gonna come back to that. In the infinite loop, we read the ID of the tag and then we do a check. If that ID is in authorized users. And in Python, this is a way of saying, is this string in this list? If it is, then we print access granted. If it's not, we print access denied. So what I'm gonna do is copy this string that we printed for debugging. Right click copy. I'm going to paste it into this list of authorized users. You can see that I've got it wrapped in quotes here. So the Python knows it's a string. Now when I rerun the script and I'll hold that same tag, we get access granted. If I hold any other tag to the reader, we get access denied. Because this is a list, we could also add the blue tag to the list of authorized users. I'll just copy that, right click copy, and I'll add it to this list. So I need to put in a comma and then a quote and close that quote. So now we have a list of two authorized tags. And sure enough, if I hold the tag, we get access granted. If I hold the other tag, access granted. And of course the third tag is still denied. How good. You know, a really cool feature of these tags is that they can be set up to be interactive. What I mean by that is you can program certain data onto the tag so that when they're scanned by some smart reader, like a smartphone, it can trigger that device to perform some action. That could be opening a web page or composing an email to a specific recipient. It can even be like geographical coordinates to a specific location. Find the example for creating an interactive tag and copy that example code. Overwrite everything in main. And let's take a look at what we're working with. We have the same setup as before. And then we have a couple of things defined called URIs. Now URI stands for Universal Resource Indicator. And that basically just tells the scanning device, like the phone, what it is we're looking at. Are we looking at a web address or a phone number or an email address? That's all handled by the URI scheme. We declare a variable web address and assign it the string of some web address. And the URI for that is the HTTP or HTTPS URI. We have here some latitude and longitude. So we have some coordinates here and that is handled by the geo tag. We even have an email address and the URI scheme for that is mail to followed by the email address. And finally a phone number. So these are just defined strings, but in the loop, we check if a tag is present. And if it is, then we just write a specific URI to that tag. Let's give it a go. By default, we're working with the web address. I'll run this script and hold my tag to the module and the write is successful and the script finishes. And now for the moment of truth, I'll hold the tag to the back of my phone. There's a buzz and my phone, it looks like it's opening a web page. There we have it. It's opened up a web page that was specified in the script. And this is just a search for all the PicoDev articles. Let's try something else. I'll copy the name of that geolocation variable and paste it in. Rerun the script. Program the tag. Let's see what happens now. I'll hold the tag to the back of the phone. And it's opened up a menu to look at these 
coordinates. And sure enough, the map opens and drops a pin right at those coordinates that we were looking at. How good is that? At the time of writing, this next example is only compatible with ntag213 tags. So in the last example, the data we were writing was only really useful to some kind of smart device that could read it. This next example is all about writing our own data to the tag and then reading it back using the RFID module so we can use it in our own projects. There's an example here for writing text. So grab that example, copy it into main.py, and let's give it a run. I'll hold my tag to the module, and we can see now the tag has been programmed with the text, hello world, exclamation point. And we can see we can encode capital letters and even some other ASCII characters. After the normal initialization, we assign the string hello world to my string. And then in the infinite loop, we just call RFID write text, and we're writing my string to the card. Now you can store up to 143 text characters on one of these cards. And just to prove there's no funny business, I'll pull out the read text example, and we should be able to read that string back. I'll run that script. I'll take the same card, hold it to the module, and it has pulled out hello world. So this one looks very similar. It's just not priming the card with any text at the start. We just call rfid.readText and assign that to my string, which is then printed. We can also write and read numbers or specifically integers, which are positive or negative whole numbers. We can store some pretty big numbers on these cards. Find the write numbers example, and I'll just copy all of that into main.py again. Run the script. And we'll write it to the same card. So this will overwrite the text essentially. So here I've written the number to the tag 123456. So what's that? That's like 123,456. The same setup as usual. This time we call RFID write number. We write the number that we want and something called slot equals zero. This is the location of memory in the card that we want to write the data to. In total, there are 36 slots numbered 0 to 35, and slots are just something that we're calling a memory location that's safe to write to. There are actually plenty of other memory locations on an RFID card that you could write to, but these ones you can write to safely without damaging anything. Writing to the other memory locations can be problematic because if you do the wrong thing, it can break your card. And each of these slots can store a very large number. What's that? A 10-digit number. Uh, either positive or negative. So this wrote the number to slot zero, and then to prove that it's on the card, it then reads it back by calling the read number function. And here we just need to tell the function what slot to read back from. And of course, there's a matching read numbers example as well. Now it's possible to have up to four RFID modules all connected on the same PikaDev bus. Here I've brought a second RFID module in, and it's just daisy chaining off the first. The only requirement is that they all have unique address switch settings. So down here on the bottom of the module is the address switch labeled ASW. We've been working with our first module with both switches in the off position. That's where the switches are down. For this next module, I've set the first address switch, that's ASW1, into the on position. And you can see that clicked up just there. Do this with the modules powered off. I'll reconnect the modules to power. The address switches are only read on power up. So if you change them while the device is powered, you'll have to unplug and then replug power. And I'll grab that example for reading from multiple modules and paste that into main. I'll run this script and we'll just take it for a spin. I'll hold my tag to my first module and we get in the shell RFID A followed by the ID of the tag. I'll hold my tag to the second module and we get RFID B with that same ID, because we're using the same tag. So you can see we can clearly differentiate which RFID reader this information is coming from. To handle two devices in the code, it just changes how we initialize them. Here we can see the initialization for what we're calling reader A, which is our first module. Now the initialization function has an, an argument in it, ASW, and a list of two numbers. ASW represents the address switch, also labeled ASW. You can see for our first unit, switch one is off and switch two is off. So in the first position, we have a zero for off. And in the second position, we also have a zero for off. But for reader B, 
we initialize that with ASW equals one, zero, because the first switch is on and the second switch is off. So because that first switch is on, there is a one in this first position. And then the rest of the script is pretty familiar. We just check if there's a tag present on both readers and print the ID if there is. So we do our first check for tag reader A and then tag reader B, we check tag present. And the print statements are just a little bit different so that in the shell, reader A is always printing on the left and B is always printing on the right. But yeah, the crux of reading from multiple modules is that they have unique switch positions. And then when we initialize them, we just have to tell our code what those switch positions are. If you're an advanced user and you just prefer to use I squared C addresses, you can find the table on the back of the module, which decodes the address switch positions into the actual hex addresses for the I squared C bus. So if you prefer to just use addresses, then you can change that to equals zero X to C for that first module. And of course, this would decode into address equals zero X to D. And that will work just as well. You can see I can still read from read RFID A and RFID B, just fine. So there you have it. We started pretty simple, just reading some basic IDs, but pretty soon we were able to change the program so that we could differentiate between tags and change how our program behaved. That was the access control example. Then we moved on to creating interactive tags where we can actually hold them to a smart device like a phone and have it trigger some action like open a map all the way up to reading from multiple RFID modules. If you make something cool from these startup projects or if you just have some questions, let us know on the article for this tutorial. We're full-time makers and happy to help. Until next time, thanks for watching.